Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Have you heard the phrase, silence is golden? Do you know where it comes from? Well, don't go back, neither does anyone else. It is one of the oldest phrases known in recorded history. I don't know if you knew that or not. I mean, it predates America, it predates Europe. It is found written in the hieroglyphs of ancient Egypt. It is an extremely old statement. And if you are from a family that has lots of kids, or like our family, you've got kids from everywhere coming in all the time and going out all the time at our house, then you know that silence is golden at times. And you know, there have been actual studies done of this. People that work in offices that have fax machines and phones and printers and, and lots of conversation and everything going on all the time, that their stress level is up, their, their productivity is down, they're, they're anxious, they're frustrated, they're at times even angry, and they carry that home with them. And it affects their relationships outside of work in a negative way. Contrast that with studies that have been done with people who work in quiet offices. Their productivity is up, they're calm, their digestion is better, they sleep better at night. When they get off work, they feel more refreshed at the end of the day. Their relationships are stronger. Silence is golden in a lot of ways. But what about when silence is not so golden? What about when you have an argument with your spouse and you get the silent treatment? Silence is not so golden. What about when you walk through a cemetery to visit the grave of someone that you loved that you lost? Silence is not so golden. What about when you go to the nursing home and you see people who are simply just shells of their former selves? Silence is not golden. What about women who are in abusive relationships or children who are suffering from childhood sexual abuse who are scared to cry out and tell anyone? Silence is definitely not so golden at times like that. And what about when God says, enough is enough, and simply turns away and speaks nothing to his people? Silence. Silence would be death. That's exactly what happened. You see, we are finishing our series of sermons on the prophets, and we come to the very last book of the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi. And you have to understand the times. We've been in Haggai and Zechariah the last two weeks. They've rebuilt the temple. They're worshiping God after that 80 years in exile. And now it's been about 100 years. And what have the people of God done since the temple, temple was rebuilt 100 years ago? They've done the same thing that we've seen happen over and over and over again. They have rebelled against God. They've sinned against God. They have done evil in His sight. It's amazing to me that it is seemingly almost impossible for one generation who learns about faithfulness to God to teach it to another generation. It must be a flaw in us by, because of our sinful nature that we have to live through and walk through the circumstances of life to learn faithfulness. The people of Malachi's day were not faithful to God. In fact, they were pretty embittered. And I'm going to go through kind of a listing here with you and help you understand something. Because Malachi does something that's a little different than some of the other prophets. He shows us the progression of the attitude of their hearts. It's the first three chapters, real quick. The first thing that he, that he reveals is the people are saying, God doesn't love me. You know why? Because he hasn't given me what I want. I'm not getting what I want, so God must not love me. Which leads to the second attitude. They refuse to honor God. If God doesn't love me, well, I'm not going to do for him. And so instead of giving the best they have to God, they're giving the, the sick, the weak, the lame, animals, and sacrifices, and they're... they're, they're 
they're not truly worshiping God. And then that leads to if they're not being faithful with God, they won't be faithful the rest of their lives. And so they begin to enter into relationships with people of other nations and be what the Bible calls unequally yoked. The men of Israel marrying the women of the foreigners and the women of Israel marrying the men of the foreign lands. And they begin to worship idols again. So from God doesn't love me because I don't get what I want, so I will not honor God, to every part of their lives begins to drift away from God. And the next thing is they begin to redefine what is good and what is evil. But this time they don't use God's standards to say what is good and evil. They use their own personal standards. So it ends up what God has called good is called evil. And what God has said is evil is called good. And then that progresses a little bit further. That I have accomplished everything in my life on my own. God is at no part of it. In fact, everything I own belongs to me. I got it for myself. And the final stage, the final stage, why worship God? It is vain to even worship God. They went from a people who were set free to rebuild the temple to a people who have, in their heart of hearts, totally turned away from God in just two generations, eight years. And it's sad. But what is also sad is that we see so many of the same attitudes in the world today. Are there people today who say, God doesn't love me? And their justification for that is, if God loved me, he would do this for me. Or if God loved me, he wouldn't let this happen to me. You see, his love is conditional based on what they think they want. So in other words, if God gives me what I want, I'll know he loves me. But since he doesn't, I know he doesn't love me. And once that first attitude takes hold in the heart, where does it lead? Does it lead the same directions? Doesn't, don't the people who say God doesn't love me say, well, you know, if I'm going to give something to God, I'm going to give him the best. And don't we have to do a real good job of redefining what is good and what is evil by our standards instead of God's standard? And aren't they even people who say, why would anyone worship God? It's vanity. Don't we see all the same attitudes present in the world today? I think we do. And the message that Malachi is given to speak to the people just before God goes silent. Because it's going to be 400 years between the prophet Malachi and the time God speaks again. Malachi is given a message to speak. God is coming. And what we need to understand is the message that was given to Malachi is just as relevant for us today. The question is, are we, do we really understand what it means that God is coming? Listen to his words. I want you to hear what he says. For the bubble, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogance and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. And it will leave them neither root or branch. What is Malachi saying? The time is coming when God's going to come and he's going to judge the world. And those who are evildoers, those who do not know him, those who are unbelievers, they're going to, to in a sense, be thrown into the oven. You ever see dry grass when it burns? You ever see dry grass? You set fire to it and immediately it just, it's gone. Nothing but ash and it blows away. And that is a horrifying thought. It's a terrifying thought to think of that day, the day we call Judgment Day. It's frightening. And that day there will be silence. Because the people of this world who do not know God, they're going to be saying, hey God, go away now. I did this. And there's no excuses. There's no justification. There's no arguing with God. God will say, Silence. And that's it. It's a terrifying thought. 
Well, Malachi tells us is that day is real. That day is coming. But before that day comes, God's going to do something else. He says, For behold, I send my messenger who will prepare a way for me, and he will come and suddenly and appear in his temple, the messenger that I send. You see, God is a God who is going to come at the end of time for judgment. But what does he reveal? That he is a God who desires to save. That he's a God who desires to be gracious and merciful. Yes, the end day is coming, but there's another day before that. It's a day when God comes to this temple, the very same temple Malachi is talking about, where the people that have rejected God, where the people that they worship God do so in a mocking way, where the people half-heartedly even acknowledge that God exists, he's going to come to that very temple. And when Jesus came, what was the world like? It was a dead religion. It was a lifeless religion. It was a faithless religion. <clears throat> it was a religion of rules and regulations. He said, my messenger's going to come. And he's going to establish a new covenant. The covenant he established when he went to the cross and made the perfect sacrifice for sin. You see, God is either judge or he's savior. He wants to be saved. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came into the world and did not know him and did not understand him. And that's a challenge that we have today. And there were people in Jesus' day when he talked about going to the cross and it will never happen. Peter said that. There were people in Jesus' day that said, I can never follow a man going on a cross. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes and says of the people of his day, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. How many times have I told you in Bible classes and other things, think of what the message of this church, the message of Christianity is to people who don't know God. Think about it for a moment. How ridiculous does it sound? Use your logic. How ridiculous does it sound that a man hanging up on a cross 2,000 years ago on the other side of the world has anything to do with my life today? The cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. That's what Paul said. Because they don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. But that's not all the verse. The cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to we, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It doesn't make any sense. Jesus on the cross is foolishness until God works in the heart. Because the moment we can hear the message, the moment we look to Jesus, the moment we understand in our heart of hearts that Jesus went to that cross 2,000 years ago because I'm a sinner. That Jesus went to that cross 2,000 years ago because I'm lost. That Jesus suffered the judgment of God on that cross 2,000 years ago, so I would never have to fear the end of time. The moment we realize that Jesus did it for me, faith is born. And in that instance, what we believe was foolish is the power of God to save. That's who our God is. He's not a God who wants to judge. He is a God who yearns to save, even to the point that he would suffer and die on the cross. So we would never have to fear judgment. The day will come, yes, the end of time will happen. Either we will die or, or Jesus will return on the clouds. And on that day, there'll be many people who wish I'd never been born. That's not us. That's not who we are. That's a day of celebration. That's a day when we experience the ultimate victory with singing and dancing as we're ushered into the kingdom of God. There is no fear in judgment. Why? Because perfect love casts out all fear. And God has had absolute perfect love for you and His Son. We don't have to worry about Judgment Day. We don't have to worry about the oven and the, the dry grass 
you know, the image that Micah gives us. We don't have to worry about that because that will never touch us. Because Jesus has won for us forgiveness. The question is, now, what about us today? How are we now to live as the people of God? You know, we live in a, in a world, and sometimes we're guilty of this, where we seemingly can Google and find the answer to anything. We, we have you know, answers and, and systems of thought and belief that we almost, it's almost that God's kind of there on some things we don't really use much for us to be. We think we know everything. To which God would say what? Silence. I have something to say. You know, it's a phenomenon that any, any teacher, especially elementary age teacher, can tell you. God created the body in a wonderful way. If the mouth is open, the ears don't work. <laughs> if you close the mouth, the ears work just fine. God wants us to stop, be silent, and listen to Him. What does He desire for you? What are His plans for you? Are you everything in this moment that God has created and desires for you to be? No, I'm not. I mean, it's kind of like in Wednesday Bible study, we had the text, let him who has no sin cast the first stone. Can any of us throw the first stone? Can any of us stand up and say, I've arrived, I'm perfect? You see, God has a plan and a will for your life today. And that's not always easy. In fact, at times, it can be downright painful. Because God wants to change who you are. Because you're not perfect, you're not holy, you're not the pure reflection of Jesus in the world. He wants you to become more than you are. And change is always hard. And change is always painful. And yet, when we get through that time of change, we know it's good. It's good for us and it's good for everyone else. So Malachi uses two illustrations to talk about how God is going to work in our lives. He says he's going to use the fuller's soap and he's going to refine us as silver is refined. Now the silver one is not so hard to understand, but the fuller's soap doesn't make any sense to us at all because that's the thing we do today. But think about first century Israel. Jesus is the good shepherd, a lot of imagery of, of agriculture. And there were sheep everywhere. So they would, you know, cut the wool off the lambs and they would weave it in the cloth. But can you imagine taking raw wool off a lamb and weaving it in the cloth? It would be thick and scratchy and dirty. It would be difficult to use. That's where the fullers came in. It was a trade in the first century. They dug clay out of the ground. It was a heavy apple and clay. And they would wash these, this wool on, on, in rivers and beat it with rocks and scrub it with this soap that would, with the alkali substance in it, would, would bleach the wool, it would smooth the wool, it would stretch the wool out and make gleaming white material that could then be used to sew and to make garments. The image of being gleaming white is the image of holiness. The process to get gleaming white is painful. And yet, in the end, what starts out as rough and unusual, be unusable, becomes something beautiful and very usable. That's the image of God working in us to create in us and change us to make us who He desires for us to be. Now, like I said, that's what He's going to do in each one of you. But then He gives a second illustration, and I do think it's easier to understand. Refine you as silver is refined. There's an, in, there's an individual who, a young man, who wanted to understand that. So he went to a jeweler, and he asked the jeweler if he could watch him work with silver. So he would understand how to apply this. And so the jeweler agreed, and, and he took him in the back room and showed him, you take the silver, and you put it over the flame, over the very hottest part of the flame. Because it's at the hottest part of the flame that the impurities are and he sat there and he watched it. And the young man said, well, do you have to stand right here? Why can't you leave it to something else? He said, because if you leave it in the flame too long, the silver itself will be burned up. So you have to know just the right time to take the silver out of the flame so the impurities are, are taken out, but you don't destroy the silver. 
To which the logical question that went asked was, how do you know when is the time to take it out of the flame? The jeweler said, that's easy. The silver is pure when I can see my own, my own reflection. Do you understand what God is doing? That from now until the time you go into eternity, God is working in your life to mold you and shape you and help you to become everything he desires for you to be. And when he is done, what will he see? His reflection in you. And it's then that he can use you. Because the people in this world don't know God. They think it's foolish to serve God. They think the cross is foolishness. They don't understand what God is really like, what's in his heart. And it's when they see the reflection of Jesus in you, as you love them, as you help them, as you have compassion for them, as you speak words of encouragement to them, as you live your life as a reflection of Jesus, that they will begin to understand what God is really like. And then he will do that great work in their hearts. Silence is truly golden in the right context. This world doesn't need silence from God. This world needs to hear and see who God is. And you are honored. I'm honored. The church of Jesus Christ is honored to be those who reflect Him and speak for Him so that the silence can be broken and life can be And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, and the life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. I want you to keep your seats.